Welcome to Midpoint, OCC's midweek podcast aimed at helping you connect with last week's message and prepare you for next week's sermon. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Midpoint, your midweek connection to Orchards Community Church. Last week, Pastor James talked with us through Acts 15, 36 through 16, 10. Yes. Big section. It was. Where you talked us through how God guides the early church and in turn believers today towards God's will. Yeah, that was, I thought, the, the clearest takeaway there. It was a neat intro to Paul and uh, Silas's second missionary journey there for Paul, but but the takeaway, I thought, was more about being led by the Lord. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think you you define this a little bit, and I didn't have this in our script, so I'm, I'm sorry, but um, can we define God's will just a little bit? What are you referencing when we're just saying yeah. towards God's will? What right. does that mean? Yeah, I don't know if we can define it just a little bit. Okay. Uh, it, it's, well, I mean, there, there's the real short answer, yeah. and then there's how do you get to oh, yeah, the of course. spot. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the deal. I think to be in God's will is the spot where we are bringing Him the glory that He's so worthy of with the things that we're participating, joining Him in. I think that's pretty I mean, straightforward. So, so that, that part is. The trick is, I mean, that's an every day and every hour of every day and every Agreed. minute of every day thing. So the practicality becomes really, really hard. I think the the trickiest part of answering a question like that is that there is a spot where you go, oh, gosh, this is it. This is the place yeah. God would have me, and I'm doing the thing God would have me do. But the beauty of our sovereign God, our loving sovereign God, is that even if we get off that path, there's a way to get back on, and Agreed. He leads us and guides us. So that, yeah. that, that's a great question. I mean, we could do a whole midpoint on that one question and go for hours and hours. The definition <laughs> yeah. of God's will is a yeah. huge thing. Yes, yeah, but but it, the, the short form answer is, are we joining Him where He's at work, trying to make sure He gets the glory? Yeah, and I, I think defining God's will is what He's he calling us to do, Yeah, and His will is what He has... Okay, we're going to get a little ordained for us, mm-hmm. but I mean, that's part of it as well, is yeah. what is he ordained and mm-hmm. how are we keeping in line with that? So, yep. Absolutely. Yep. We had a uh, few questions come in and want to say thank you when people do that and encourage people to continue sending in questions. They really help us understand where to lead this and where this needs to go and what people are struggling with and yeah. need to talk about. So please keep sending them in and we'll get to that here in a minute. Of yeah, where we, we are wanting those. to interact with you on these things. want to try and address the questions that you have out of the sermon stuff. For sure. First question is, was Paul wrong in refusing to bring John Mark along? It seems that Paul was holding on to some resentment that resulted in a lack of unity. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, you know, we get the, the beauty of reading it now, you know, long, long after it happened. Did Paul make a mistake? <laughs> that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, the, the reality is, and this was, I tried to encapsulate it the best way I could in the sermon, he had a different perspective. Like he yeah. truly saw the work laid before him, and John Mark did, you know, bail out on that first yeah. journey. So, and there's consequences to your actions. I mean, I see all those things in it. What we get the beauty of seeing in hindsight is that John Mark was wildly used by God as he continued. Agreed. Obviously, you know, being inspired to share one of the gospel accounts, but even to Paul personally, you mm-hmm. know, there at the end of his journey, Paul's saying, hey, I got to have that John Mark guy with Send me. Send him back, you know? yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think it's just an opportunity for both of them to really grow in that. Mm. Was Paul wrong or was Paul being used by God to help develop John Mark? <laughs> That's the thing, you know, without, you know, being able to see hearts and, and right. know the way God's at work, that it's hard to answer. But, you know, I mean, just on the surface, when you look at it, yeah, I think Paul kind of, kind of messed up there. Yeah. But again, that introduces Timothy into ministry. He winds up being you know wildly used as well. And, and kind of the neat bottom line on it, you got two missionary teams instead yeah. of just the one. So I see a sovereign God in that, but it is fun to poke at the question, hey, did Paul make a mistake? <laughs> I think the one that, that kind of stood out to me is this idea of resentment. Yeah, yeah. If he did it because he was just being petty, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know because we see that he didn't bring John Mark along because John Mark bailed on him, yeah, and so it was this level. Was it a level of distrust? Yeah. Was it a level of hurt? Was it a level of frustration? Was it the resentment, or was it truly, hey, I feel God calling me to say no so that a second team is set yeah. up, yeah. or I don't and, know. And, but again, sometimes God uses us in those circumstances, and we don't even really know. Like, we we could go back ourselves and go, well, I made a bad decision here. Yeah. And it winds up being the best decision. Great. And, and that's the part we said earlier. If we're trying to, to address God's will on that, God works in ways that we are never going to be able to comprehend. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and that makes it very difficult. I, 
one of the neat things in the Acts of the Apostles is it truly is a summation of all these things that are going on. And so you have no idea. Like John Mark did bail on the first trip. We get that. But I remember preaching through that a couple months ago. We don't even know why he bailed. Yeah. Did he bail because Paul got sick? Did he bail because he was offended that Barnabas wasn't the top dog? I mean, we don't know those things. Yeah. Agreed. And so then not knowing that, it's hard to know now why Paul says, no, he can't come back. Because Agreed. we don't know the actual reason <laughs> that he left in the first place. Yeah. We it don't... makes it very difficult to, to wrestle that one to the ground. We don't know if it was it was valid. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, then it, it's hard to understand if Paul's re, you yeah. know, reaction is valid. Yeah. But but again, even if John Mark's reason for leaving wasn't valid, we know that he winds up growing exponentially. So yeah. that's fantastic. Agreed. So agreed. Yeah. But but those are fun. those are to me are the ones when we always talk about areas when we have unity and diversity. Pe- people could have all kinds of opinions on this. We just don't know. Those mm-hmm. to me are great dialogue. That that's great sit, time to sit with brothers and sisters mm-hmm. and, and just really go, man, I don't know how how neat is that. And we can agree to disagree on that area. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah, I, I, it's a really interesting thought yes. process of was Paul right? Was yeah. he wrong? Was that the right choice? Yeah. Obviously, God used it. Obviously, see. God resulted in massive glory from yeah. John Mark. And, and we, we get to see that part, so that's the easy part to focus on. For sure, yeah. for sure. Talking about unity kind of moves us right into our next question here. God has called believers to have unity within the church, but unity is not always possible. What are some times that it's okay for there to be a lack of unity within churches? Yeah, and I, and I appreciate revisiting that even, because that is that thing. We've talked about this uh, several times over the last few weeks. Uh, there are core doctrinal issues. There are essential truths that you have to, to mm. stand firm on. Um, we're having a neat opportunity right now, walking just in our staff meetings through our belief statements on the website, and you guys can check all those out if you go www.lewistonocc.org and click on what we believe. And yeah. those are statements that kind of guide how we're trying to join God and be in the church He wants us to be. It's good stuff. Well, it's just a neat opportunity for us to be able to kind of try and frame some of those things into the way that we're able to defend, well, this is why we see this in Scripture. For sure. And, and, and so in that, there were some core things we were talking about today that legitimately, they, they, it'd be really hard to move on. Mm-hmm. Miracles like virgin birth, like resurrection, like ascension. Uh, those kind of things, you know, th- those fall into those essential doctrinal mm-hmm. issues. If somebody doesn't believe in the resurrection, it would really be hard to have unity <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with somebody like that. And, and so those things become core. What we've probably talked a little bit more about, and I know certainly we have through the sermon series, has been these uh, liturgical issues or, or, or traditions that different mm. you know denominations practice. And again, those are things where I think you can have unity in a lot of areas with churches, local mm-hmm. churches that don't believe the same thing about what I would consider some core issues. You know, if, if a church believes, just for instance, well, you have to be baptized to be saved, we would never you know agree to share a pulpit with them and and you know teach on that particular doctrine, but. If there was a big service project in the community, we could go lock arms with them and say, well, we're partnering with this church to serve the yeah. community. So, th- so even in those areas, th- there would be areas of agreement and areas of disagreement. <laughs> but you know, so, so it becomes you know, really that tricky line, the unity versus disunity. I mean, clearly you have disunity with cultish religions. You have disunity with you know, pagan gods, things like yeah, that. For sure. But you can try to find some unity in being the body of Christ even if you have disagreements over, I think, things that are essential. Mm. It, it, that one is, that, that's much more a practice question th- mm. than a theory question, because on, on the theory parts, you can say, well, hey, and, and again, there are some big issues with, with churches that appear successful mm. here in the, in the West, and certainly in the United States, that preach a prosperity gospel. Yeah, you know, And sure. you're like, how could you really partner with, the, <laughs> with those churches? It becomes very, very difficult because their core beliefs are way different. You know, mm-hmm. To say that God's going to bless you financially if you're a solid Christ follower is nowhere to be found in Scripture. <laughs> I mean, you, you can you know, pull some stuff out of context and try and, and get it there, but when you study it in its context, that's not the deal whatsoever. Still waiting for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Keep waiting. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> I thought that's the point of becoming yeah. a pastor was, you know... Everybody knows we do this for the bucks. Come on, man. <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> if you could see me and Andrew's faces right now, there's a reason we do this audio only. <laughs> <laughs> Guess we're both just rolling our eyes. <laughs> I think that's such a tough thing, and I, I think you brought it up, is that unity, yeah. you know, within, within what it means to follow Christ... There is what it called to be unified as a follower of Christ and as a, you know, as family, 
as the big, you know, as the church, universal church. But then there's also the idea of disunity within yeah. those that cannot claim yeah. Yeah. the core doctrines of, um, you know, of Christian faith. And I think that that part of this idea is that we need to be willing to die to ourselves. And you you keep Always. pushing at yeah. this um, <laughs> each week, and it's are we dying to ourselves? Are we willing to set aside our desires, our wants, our preferences for a heart to die to ourselves and for a heart for unity, even when we may not like yeah. what it is? Yeah, and that, that's been, uh, I hope, refreshing over the last couple of weeks, even with James's instruction out of the Jerusalem Council. Mm. It's okay to ask people to die to themselves, even brand new believers, which is a, a stretch for me. Mm. But in that, the, do we know why we're asking them? Do we know that we should also be willing to die to ourselves mm. in areas, like you say, that, that are not going to be essential areas of salvation or, or doctrinal issues? Mm. Can we you know, not eat meat if it would offend? You know, I mean, we just have to figure out what that looks like to mm. us. You know, I, I've, I've had good conversations with, um, with people that I really love, solid Christ followers over the years, and, and they just really struggle with whatever. You know, I don't mm. want to name even a, a people group or whatever, you know, but, mm. but they just struggle, oh, this kind of person really bothers me. Mm-hmm. Well, that kind of person is still valued and loved by God, Agreed. and they, need, they deserve to hear the gospel message. What if you're the person who's supposed to share it with them? Mm. Would you be willing to die to the uncomfortable nature <laughs> of sitting and, and approaching somebody like that in order for God to get the glory? Mm. Those are the questions we really have to wrestle with. And I think that's, yeah. that's, that's so key. That as the church body, when things are not the salvation way. affecting yeah. or fellowship affecting mm-hmm. issues, we need to be willing to die to ourselves yeah. for honoring God and for unity mm-hmm. and for you know the the edification of the body, for yeah. the up the the holding up of the body. And I think that's that's what what this is so key about. Yeah. So very well sure. Uh, moving on to our next question here: Why do you think the Holy Spirit did not allow Paul and Timothy into Bithyna, Bithyna when others went into Bithyna? Yeah. Um, I struggle with that name a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> I got it. I, I've heard it before as Bithynia, but I don't know that it matters the name of it. You know, Bithynia the reality is, makes more sense. Yeah, the, the reality is, I don't know. Like that is a weird one to me. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, for sure. Why? Why didn't he go down to Asia Minor to start? Why couldn't he go to Bithynia when Peter later was allowed? I mean, that's one of those. I never want to use it as a cop out, but there's that wonderful verse in Isaiah that says, you know, God's ways are higher than mm-hmm. our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we have to be willing to say, if I can't figure that out, but God clearly is leading, then am I just going to follow, you know? Mm-hmm. And and for whatever reason, in the same way we don't know why Timothy was supposed to go on the second missionary journey and John Mark wasn't with mm-hmm. Paul, Timothy, you know, gets to hang out with Paul and, and later, of course, become, you know, a guy that Paul is directly pouring into, like he does Titus, where we get yeah. canons of scripture that come from those guys, where John Mark went with Barnabas and winds up recording a gospel account. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. We can see that. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know I don't know why. I mean, that, that's the part. So, so why didn't Paul get to go into these particular areas? And then later, of course, I mentioned, he does go into Asia Minor later. Yeah, later. You know, and so, so how, you know, I think some of those things are truly about our application today. Mm. Like, we're supposed to get some takeaways from that. Hey, I I asked God about this thing, and God said no, but that doesn't mean I can't go ask him next year, or Mm. next month even, whatever, you know, and and say, hey, God, that was a no then. We talked about this, oh gosh, I've preached this a few times when it has fallen into context. God answers prayer in four ways, and I think it's really, really clear to see. And, and, you know, I always use the, there's a alliteration thing, because I, sometimes I get alliteration happy. <laughs> but the easiest way I always think of it is no, go, grow, or slow. Mm-hmm. And that's not alliterative, but it, it help, it's a, a mnemonic device to help you remember. And, and so sometimes he says no, and mm-hmm. sometimes he says yes. So it's go in this regard. But sometimes he says grow, and, and it's mm. that's going to be a thing that you can do when you are ready. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he says slow, that's going to be a thing that you're going to do when I'm ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah, amen. And, and so in that, we have to realize God's still the one in, in sorry, charge of all those things. And so for whatever reason, and again, I, I think maybe the people of Bithynia weren't ready yet at mm. that time. And, and so God was waiting on that. And then later they're ready. He's going to send Peter in. I don't know. Yeah. To me, and of course this, you know, the, where I, these are the conversations I love happening. How did Paul know he was forbidden to go? I was I literally was just going to mention that. Like, <laughs> yeah. what was it? This wall that shows up? Nope. Yeah, I mean, like, is he walking literally? I always think of the movies where he hit the invisible force field, you know? <laughs> like, he's yeah. walking and boom, he just bounces back. I guess we're going that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and those to me are funny. Like, I don't understand how God works in that. I just read in his word that he did, mm, you know? Yeah. And, and so, like I say, they're... 
that'd be a lot of fun to, to continue to poke into how, how do you know you're forbidden to go? And, mm. and uh, there's a, oh, what's that old um, Jim Carrey movie, uh, Bruce Almighty, oh, where, yes. where he's yeah. driving along behind the truck full of signs mm. and he's asking, <laughs> you know, God, just show me a sign. And there's signs like falling out of the yeah. truck in front of him and he just totally ignores him. You know, sometimes I think God is trying to give us some signs. Mm. No, don't go there. Don't do this. And we just ignore the signs. Here, I guess, praise the Lord, Paul didn't ignore the sign, mm, and he amen. wound up doing exactly what he was supposed to do. And of course, we're going to see as he continues forward. I mean, for a third missionary journey, potentially a fourth, you know, it, depending on, on which scholars you follow on that, mm. but he's going to continue being used in the direction that God was leading him. Yeah, for sure. And God didn't forget all these other people. He just led somebody else to go <laughs> minister to them. And I think that's such an interesting thought process is when God says no, yeah. what does that look like for us as believers? How do we react? Yeah. Are we are we Paul that that turn and go that you know continue following and continue waiting, or are we yeah. the one that sit there and keep yeah. pounding on the no, door saying? No, sometimes I'm me and I'm just frustrated. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I get mad and and I pound but, on, I pound on the door yeah. until. Oh yeah, you know. and and again, that that probably all comes for a sur- full circle to die into ourselves. W- when I say, "Well, I, I want to do this thing because I think this is what you want me to do," God, am I really saying I want to do this thing because it's mm-hmm. what I want to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, good questions. <laughs> I think for me, what I find a lot of times is when God says no, I am so I tend to then try to sidestep him. Yeah, and yeah. be like, "Ooh, there's a gap in the in the fence over here. I'm going to slide through the gap." Yeah. And then I then it just falls apart. Yeah, and then it's just not waiting on God's perfect timing and His yeah. will and and those things. Uh, there are we come and, back to consequences for our <laughs> our actions. And that's something I struggle with is yeah. is is learning to not sidestep God, but yeah. learning to hit the let's just the invisible wall and say, yeah. okay, God, I'm going to back up, and now where you want me to go? Because yeah. you you said no, and so how do I react? Mm-hmm. And so I don't do that very well. <laughs> Sometimes we just confess on midpoint. That's all it is. That, it's <laughs> confession. We're yeah, that okay. Next next part. <laughs> I was gonna make a joke, but decided not to, and That's we're gonna keep going. Probably best to stay away from those. Um, <laughs> before I get in trouble here, let's go number four. Uh, last question that we have here is: We see in this passage passage that God spoke to Paul through a vision. Yeah, I love that. Do you think that God still speaks through visions to believers today? If yes. not. <laughs> what are some ways that you see God communicating His will to believers? I, I certainly believe that God could use visions. Um, okay. And again, I, I made just such a brief reference to that in the sermon. I just don't think we we see a lot of people who are really open to it mm. in the West. And some of that, and I'm not trying to knock it whatsoever, this is the place where God has, has put us. We do have copies of His Word, which mm-hmm. is His instructions to us. And, and so we can hear from God through reading His Word and I mean, I'm not going to try and put a statistic on this, but I bet you could walk into every home in the valley mm. and find a Bible. I literally feel like you could. I would be incredible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, the problem is, do they even know where it is? Has mm. it been cracked open in a long time? So the fact that there are Bibles available here, again, in America, throughout the West, mm. um, in, in more developed countries, and then, of course, and again, not trying to, to be weird about this, there's a church on every corner here mm. in the valley, here in the United States. I mean, like, you, you can throw a rock and hit a church from almost any place you live. What's what's it, the street down in Clarkston where it's literally like five churches yeah. that literally are if, all... If you go yeah. di- down Diagonal yeah, Street, it. yeah, you don't even have to throw rocks. You, you can spit and hit churches going it's, down... There. It's literally church, 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 yeah, church. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. And, and it's like I say, so when, when you look at stuff like that, there are plenty of places for a person who is feeling... Uh, whatever it would be, nudged, urged, mm-hmm. hey, you need to go to a church, they're, they're around, you know? Mm. Um, so does God have to work in visions or dreams or whatever? No. Can he? I 100% believe he can. Absolutely. I yeah. really do. And of course, you hear more stories about this in developing countries where mm. legitimately there may not be a missionary there, there may not be a church there, there may not be a translated copy of God's word there. Mm. And so that would make more sense that God would mm-hmm. use than the visions and dreams. One of the most powerful stories I remember hearing, um, and, and it wasn't uh, truly in, in that regard, but it fits kind of the criteria. And I think I might have shared this in Midpoint one time before, but I had a young guy who was a Young Life volunteer mm-hmm. with me, and still a friend of mine to this day, and and not a young dude anymore, a very accomplished doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, <laughs> but just a neat young man that was leading a ministry for me, almost in a position like you have with Josh, where you're kind of trying yeah, to pour, sure. pour into this guy, and he's he's got some ministry responsibilities. And we were talking a lot over the course of a year or so mm-hmm. about the passage in Thessalonians about being able to pray continually. Mm-hmm. You know, and and my buddy Ricky just really kind of struggled with that notion. He's like, I don't understand how that would work. You know, and, and just you know, he, practically, he yeah. was struggling with it. For 
for sure. And so, you know, we continued talking through, Hey, what do you do? And I shared kind of my story with him that like I used to, and I thought I was crazy, honestly, for years as a, as a younger man, I just talked to myself. Like mm. I, I would always kind of talk to myself. And so after I became a Christ follower, I didn't even really think about hitting a different button or resetting or whatever. I just all of a sudden started talking to God instead of talking mm. to myself, you know, and it was like God had equipped me years before I was going to become a Christ That's follower really cool. to do this. Yeah. And so, and I, and I remember where it kind of happened for me. I was standing up in the stock room at the sporting goods store that I, that I managed and owned and I realized I was praying mm. and like I, I hadn't, I didn't fold my hands and Hey, dear Lord. It was just, I realized I had this conversation. It was so cool. Kind mm. of a, an epiphanous moment. Still remember where I was standing. Still remember how I was, this this is an important part of the story, but I, I was stocking jock straps up, <laughs> up in the, and, and and that's exactly like at that moment I was like I'm not thinking about doing this I'm praying. It's weird, I, weird I love thing. that you included that. That's <laughs> yeah. I, I normally don't amazing. include that part of the story, but literally I, I just had that picture in my head of that's exactly where I was standing. So. I part of me just <laughs>, laughs and gets a picture in my brain of God being like. James, I love yeah. that you're talking to me. Can we move yeah. a different yeah. section? Like, <laughs> let's keep talking you, over here. Want to move over to the knee braces? Yeah. No, uh, but that's where it was for me. And, and so, anyway, had this conversation with with my friend Ricky as you're stalking jocks. Yeah. No. No. That left. Oh, okay. Left that to, to continue it. to continue the conversation. That was later on as I was sharing. I Ricky. just really wanted to keep talking about that. So. <laughs> my experiences. But but anyway, it was so funny. Ricky and I had met in the morning, and and we had a regular time we were meeting, mm-hmm. and he was a student at Southeast Missouri State. University mm. where I, I attended, and he had gone to class, and then he went to lunch, mm. and he was going through the lunch line like any cafeteria that you imagine. You take your tray and you slide through whatever. And Ricky was probably a junior; he might have been a senior at that mm. time. He'd been a student there for a long time, knew all the lunch ladies, knew everybody. And there was a lady that he didn't recognize in the lunch line, mm. and she was a bigger uh, black lady, mm. and, and and real sweet. And she was kind of chatting up everybody mm-hmm. through the line, you know. Yeah. And and she was one of those ladies, uh, that, you know, that called everybody honey and sweetie and and just, you know, kind of a Southern. And, and, you know, so Ricky's going through and like he's getting ready to slide his tray by her. And I guess, I, I can't remember what she was dishing out, but he didn't want any. And so he was going to keep moving on. And she stopped him and looked right at him. And she said, you know, honey, it's not hard to pray continually. And what? <laughs> and just rocked his world, you know, and and kind of gave her 30 seconds on, here's what I do, or like that. Well, Ricky had never said anything to her about it. I mean, it was just, it had this internal struggle going on. And and so he comes immediately to tell me, you'll never, you know, I think that is the coolest thing. I think wow. that God can and still does things just like that. Because mm. there's no way this lady knew Ricky, knew what he was talking about, knew anything. And God used this woman who Ricky had never seen before mm. to to share that. God does stuff that mm. we cannot figure out because he's God, <laughs> and it's so impossible cool. for us to figure him out. <laughs> so those are the kind of things. Are we open to hearing stuff in mm. that way? Ricky could have been, this is crazy, or this lady's following me, or whatever. Instead, he was blown away yeah, by sure. the God who loves him and wanted to communicate with him. Now, he still always struggled. That wasn't an area that he'd still, even today, would say is a strength for him. Mm. But it's one of those things. And I don't think it's a thorn in his flesh either, but but I think it's one of those things. Are we growing mm. in, in our process of sanctification? Are we sure. becoming more Christ-like? And that's just an area where he's always wanted to grow more. Mm. And I think that's neat. But I love that God did that in that story. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I wonder if that lunch lady knew anything or was just literally like did, yeah, all did of a sudden she, compelled. Did she know she was used by God right in that I moment? Know, I, I do not know. I don't know. And the weird thing is Ricky said he saw her a couple more times, but then he never saw her again. You know, And so it wasn't like she was there just the one time, whatever. He did see her again and, mm-hmm. and exchanged pleasantries with her. You know, And I think even one time said, hey, thanks. You know, for I needed that, yeah. yeah. And then, so I don't know if she was like a temp worker, you know, working on a contract deal. I don't know. But God used her. <laughs> that's that's wild. I love that. The way story. that God works is yes, crazy. That's yes. nuts. So, that's so cool. So it, b- bottom line, you know, it, do I believe he could still do that? Of course, he, he mm. can use anything that he would desire. I think here in the West, most of the time, he uses pastors. He uses mm-hmm. Christ followers who who love him. He uses his word. He mm-hmm. uses the church. He uses those things that are a little more routine. But it doesn't mean they're less special in the way mm. God wants to speak to somebody. I, I, you've, you've, I guarantee, heard this from students. Mm. You probably heard it when you've had opportunities to preach. I've preached, and people say, gosh, I feel like that message is just for me. Yeah, for sure. No. But if the Holy Spirit compelled you to believe that, then, yeah, there was a part of that that God was using mm. me to speak directly to you. 
So don't discount that. That's God at work. And we have we as pastors have to be very careful to not sit here and be like, I am writing this for you. <laughs> no, there, there's I, I heard great great um, direction on that in seminary. You never mm. preach a message to one person. No, 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 uh, no, no. That's the, the, there's really not the the place to do that and be Christ honoring because what mm. you'll end up doing is soapboxing, mm. and there's just not a, a point for that when you're trying to preach the Bible. Agreed. So no, you you preach the message that. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit is is leading you to, and and you know, it, it, with the resources you typically mm. use and the gifts God has given you. I mean, that that's one of the neat things, even about looking in the canon of Scripture and recognizing mm. there's differences in the way they were written. Well, it's all inspired by the Holy mm. Spirit, but it's using Paul, and Paul writes this particular way. It's using James, and mm. James writes this way. And I think there's that neat kind of symbiosis between mm. the person God is using and the Holy Spirit who's breathing it into him. For sure. You know, so th- those things to me are wild, you know? I think a lot of times I find that I'm almost preaching to myself. I think that's the best place to start. I think yeah. a lot of times I'm, I'm realizing that what I get what I get up, whether it's, you know, with youth or college mm. or Sunday morning... That by the time I'm up up there, by the time I'm I'm sharing that what I, what God has directed me to, it's I have learned it, or I've gotten to a point that I'm I'm in process, and this is now just me starting to express what God has brought me through, and so that's that's often where I find. No, it. I I think that's wise, honestly, and I think God working on you in that, and I've said that, and I say it from the stage occasionally. Mm-hmm. I don't want to use it too much, but it's really true. So much of the time, I'm like, if God's going to beat on me about this stuff, I'm just going to beat on you guys. <laughs> I'll just share it with you because he, He's already been beating me. I that. think that's the title: the pastor <laughs> that beats beats the congregation right there. Yeah. So so no, those are the yeah. things that. For like sure. say, if God's gonna kind of wildly convict me on stuff, then I'm. I bet I'm not the only one mm. who is feeling. Wow, we need to hear this. For sure. So for sure. I, I love the old joke, and I and I, uh, I hope I don't botch it up. It's been a while since I heard it, but the the pastor who was preparing the message, and his young son is watching him, you know, write and work and toil, and he's got all the books open and everything. And, and the little boy says, "Well, how do you know what to write down?" And he goes, "Well, I just kind of write down what you know God tells me, what mm. through His Holy Spirit He tells me." And the little boy goes, "Well, how come you scratch so much stuff out then?" <laughs> and I was like, "But I know what He means." Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you're scratching it out because for time you're like, "Well, I want to try and be 40 minutes, and, and I've got an hour worth of stuff, which seems to happen to me almost every week." And sometimes you you think, "Well, I think that's what God wanted me to say," mm-hmm. and then later you're trying to put it in context, and you're like, "No, I want to think He wanted me to say it a different mm-hmm. way." So it's not that you're scratching it out, you're hopefully revising a little bit. Yeah, but, I hope so. Yeah. I think that's part of it, too. I often just sit there, and I, like, will lean back in my chair and just, like, stare at my, my screen and be yeah. like, I don't know where to go yet. Yeah. Like, I'm just waiting. I don't know what to do yet. I don't I don't know if I want to push backspace, so mm-hmm. I'm just going to wait here for a minute. <laughs> and see what God does. I'm going to just fun. sit here for a minute and, like, process <laughs> and process and read and look at the commentary and yeah. try to research. And But, yeah, I... I you, Oftentimes I'll, I'll just be leaning back in my chair sitting yeah. and I'm like, someone's going to walk by and think I'm just like taking a nap or something. <laughs> I'm really processing. <laughs> I'm I promise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So part of it for sure. Well, I think that's all the time that we have it for is, questions. Except, except you're I'm excited so, for this. You I'm are so excited so, for this part, aren't you? I'm so excited for this. We normally end the midpoint by asking what we're going to be studying next week and, mm-hmm. and how we can be praying. And Pastor Andrew's preaching this weekend, so I, am. Yes. I get to flip the script and ask him the question. Pastor Andrew, yes. what are we going to be studying this weekend? So we are preparing ourselves for Thanksgiving, yeah. and so it's a it's a Thanksgiving message and. I, you know, you kind of have given me this ability to step aside and go where God has kind of directed me. And so we're going to actually drop into um, Psalm 100 and looking at this this psalm that I love that it it's titled a psalm of giving thanks or psalm for giving thanks. And it's truly this psalm that is that is directed at Israel, but there's a lot of application with it for, for believers and just children of God in general. Um of what, how do we apply what it looks like to give thanks? And what does that look like? What's the process there? What is the growth there? And I think a lot of this is what's so interesting is I, I did a three-week series not too long ago um, leading up to Thanksgiving with um, middle school and high school. And it was a, a series called Thanks, Thankfulness. Yeah. And it was literally this series processing, like, what is what is giving thanks? How do we do it? What does this look like? Who are we giving thanks for? And so what's so been so interesting for me is God has been working on me with this topic and leading for quite a few weeks now. Okay. And so that's kind of where it's coming is I, I feel like this this message is coming from me kind of forcing myself to learn how to be more thankful yeah. and forcing myself to 
get to a spot that I am being thankful in everything I do, and I'm not grumbling. I'm not being. I'm not being frightened. I'm yeah. working in that area, and so I think a lot of this is that God has been prepping me for that and working on my heart and helping me to be more thankful in everything I do, yeah. and so. And it's funny, uh, the passage in First Thessalonians I referenced earlier with mm. my friend, you know, as the pray continually, has that mm. really, really hard command in it always, give thanks in all things. That's and really so that hard. is that is something we're supposed to be doing and, and uh, not trying to, to make it a, a point of contention here, but, you know, we, we're going to take this week to talk about gratitude and thankfulness in the church out of 51 weeks that we don't, you know, <laughs> you know and, and obviously when the text leads us to it, we'll, we'll mm-hmm. focus more on it in that. But but it is always kind of funny. We have this this week of Thanksgiving because of the Thanksgiving holiday, mm-hmm. but that's something we're supposed to be doing all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> so, yeah. so with that, I, that's a loaded question to say, what can we be doing as mm-hmm. a body to prepare for hearing the message this week? How can we be praying mm-hmm. to yeah. be more thankful? I mean, that's... I don't know how you answer that question in, in a minute, but... <laughs> I don't know. I... <laughs> I think for me, what I've been working on in prepping the series for middle school and high school and then prepping this lesson is is I've really been trying to evaluate, how am I doing in this? Yeah. Am I having a, a foundation that is built on thankfulness? Is my life built on thankfulness? Do I have a mindset? Do I have a heart that is all about being thankful? Is that my natural inclination each and every day? And I, I I'm started kind of writing something yesterday about this mind this idea of like when when your mind kind of drifts when you when you're not like almost working at being thankful where does your mind go when you're not focused mm-hmm. where does your mind go does it immediately go to grumbling does it immediately go to well that didn't go well or I'm frustrated about this or or is your mind are we working at making our mind immediately go to well I'm thankful for this and I'm, I'm I, this is how God worked in this and it's that that process of, of building our life on the foundation of gratitude yeah. And that that everything we do, the way that we interact with with our our family, with our spouse, with our relationship with God, with our kids, with everything, is that built on thankfulness? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what I've been kind of like working myself through. And so I'd encourage the church body ask that question to yourself: How are you doing with gratitude? Is, yeah. is that something you've built your life on, or is that really something you struggle with and and is not something that you practice regularly and need to be reminded? Mm-hmm. And I, I truly pray that you will work on that and prepare your hearts to then be challenged in that. Yeah, well, that's a good good challenge moving forward. I'm excited about that. Really looking forward to the not just the Thanksgiving holiday, but hearing that message. Mm. Well, I get to wrap up then. That's all the time we have for this week. I sure do hope that you've enjoyed this week's midpoint. And if you would, please send in any questions, any thoughts you have. You can email those or text those, OCC podcast at lewistonocc.org, or honestly, just come up and, and ask us the question Agreed. after a service, yeah. or, or we've got the box out there. You can write the questions down. We'd love to hear from you. Mm-hmm. And of course, I invite you to join us in our services Sunday at 9 and 1030 a.m., and then the same service Monday night at 7 p.m. in an even more relaxed setting. Mm. But we hope to see you all very, very soon. Be well, and oh, please know you're so loved by God and by Orchard Community Church. Amen. Have a good one.